You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Welcome to the Options Playbook the program where we break down cutting-edge option strategies and explain how you can incorporate them into your own portfolio. Whether you're looking to grow your capital with some offensive maneuvers or protect your investments with defensive plays, you can find them all in the Options Playbook. The Options Playbook is brought to you by Ally Invest. Anything mentioned today is for educational purposes and is not a recommendation or advice. Options involve risk. Please refer to ally.com slash invest slash disclosures to review additional risks involved with trading options. Securities offered through Ally Invest Securities, LLC, member FINRA, and SIPC. Now, let's open the playbook and get started. All right, everybody. That music means it is time once again. I'm very excited. That means it is time once again to huddle up here on OPR, of course, the show here. For you folks out there, the growing legion, the retail army (laughs) of options traders out there, you want to break down all the world of options into offensive and defensive plays. We got you covered here on OPR. Sometimes we go above and beyond. And we answer your questions as well. That's the huddle episodes. Those are always really fun. But, you know, I can't huddle up by myself. A huddle of one is by definition not a huddle. It's just a guy standing there talking to himself. And that looks weird. So let's bring on my huddle compatriot, your regular host, my options partner in crime, the options guy himself, Mr. Brian Overby from Ally Invest. Mr. Overby. Welcome back to your own show, sir. Are you ready? Are you excited? Are you psyched to huddle up? Well, I'm very, I'm very ready. I'm very excited. I'm very psyched. And I would not want you to just look like a weird guy standing in the middle of a room talking to yourself. So I'm always here for you, Mark. And when I'm here and we're both in the room together virtually, that means it's time to huddle up. <laughs> It's time to huddle up and answer questions about your favorite options plays. Submit your questions via twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or questions at the options insider.com. All right, everybody. Let's get to it. The mailbag overfloweth. On a show like this, as you can imagine, we're going to dive in. If you want to listen live, join us live out there. Get your questions at us there as well. I see you folks in there. We'll get to you. Don't worry. But let's get in first to some of these ones that have been waiting patiently, ever so patient for their answer. Let's start with Greg. Greg G. He says, hello. Well, hello, Greg. He says, I've noticed Brian has been discussing VIX more recently on OPR. Did the drop below 20 prompt this renewed interest in VIX or was it something else? How does Brian view, he's got a bunch of questions there. How does Brian view the overall role of VIX in a portfolio? Is it more of a hedge or a speculative tool? Thank you very much for the continued education that you offer on this program. It's made me into an options enthusiast. Please keep it up. Well, we're glad to hear that Brian has turned you to the dark side of options, Greg. Keep that trading up. Thanks for listening. Thanks for all the kind words. Uh, Mr. Brian, Greg here wants to know, what's up with your renewed interest, renewed fervor, I should say, in all things VIX, and how do you view it? More of a hedge or more of a speculative tool, sir? 
Well, um, I've always talked about the VIX, and every uh, we do the stock play of the day every Tuesday on the Ally YouTube channel. And I have a VIX watch list, and we bring it up. We talk a little bit about the futures, talk a little bit about where the spot is at. Um, but I think what he's referencing is uh, seven, eight weeks ago, we did a VIX trade, but we did it because the VIX had spiked above 20. And so if I'm going to be trading in the VIX, or, or as I think it was titled, we're messing with the VIX, um, I usually would like to do it what, when we get a spike up, I see the VVIX spike up with it, and I'll sell some short spreads against it overall. And it's just a speculative play in general. So I, I, not necessarily do I would I think that I talk about the VIX because it's below 20. I have more of a tendency to look at specific trades when it's actually above that 20 level. And I don't know where that 20 level came from. It just got established uh, from the big downturn in the pandemic when it took forever for the markets to get back below the 20 handle. Um, so that's kind of been the line in the sand. And that's the way the VIX works. You know, there's no fundamentals to look at. There's no, uh, no other real way to track the VIX besides just looking at the chart and seeing what's been going on recently with the actual spot, the, the, the ups and downs of the marketplace overall. Now, do I think of the VIX as a portfolio, as a hedge? Uh, I usually don't. And here's one of the things about the VIX that is tough to do. If I am buying VIX call options because I have a portfolio that of a lot of S&P 500 stocks and the VIX go, or the market goes down, the VIX skyrockets. My hardest thing with the VIX is when you get out, um, because the market might go down and stay down for the next three or four weeks, and then all of a sudden, before you know it, the VIX comes tumbling down too. So to use it as a hedge, it's a real hard product to know when you should sell it to get out of that position. So I just like to look at the VIX for what it truly is. It's you know it's it, it, it's a thing that gives you a little bit of a gauge of the angst in the marketplace uh, when it's trading a little higher. People are a little bit nervous, and I don't take it too far. Every once in a while, I use it as a trading vehicle, but it's not something that I would like to trade in day in day out because the VIX of the VIX, the V VIX, uh, is just it's you're trading so much volatility when you're trading VIX options overall. I don't mind. I just don't do it all that. Yeah, it's hard to view a VIX to me as a hedge. You know, I've always seen it as more of a speculative yeah. tool. We get that question. We used to get it all the time, not as much anymore. You know, what do you prefer, the VIX call or the spy put? And I've always come down on the spy put for many reasons that I've articulated on this network in the past. I won't go into them again, but a good question nonetheless. Now we got a twofer here, Brian, a one here in the dock and one coming in live. They're both kind of the same question. Maybe they're half joking, maybe not. This, I think this refers to something you said earlier, I think on our last live huddle, Brian. This first one comes in from Dog Runner. Maybe he's joking, maybe not. He says, hey, well, hello, Dog Runner. I like your handle. Now that Ford is at $20, does Brian have a new metric for where he will start to trade cheap options? And then we got a Mr. Unlimited in the live chat asking the same question. He says, I got to know, what is Overby's new floor? <laughs> so, Brian, <laughs> you kind of painted yourself into that corner with that Ford comment last time. Since then, it's been <laughs> shot to the moon. It's up to 20 bucks. So by your own words now, you cannot trade anything below 20 bucks on the option. So, <laughs> so catch us up. What Have you revised your thinking on using Ford as your barometer for cheap options trading? Yeah, and on top of it, the, you know, the ball has increased too. So, like, I just kind of checked, and I got to admit, I did chuckle when I read this question. Um, it's trading at around forty percent implied volatility. And thank God Ford's finally brought in, right? I mean, it's been it was a ten to twelve dollar stock for I don't know how many years overall, and it didn't deserve to be. You know, they're they're a good solid company. They went out and made ventilators in, in the middle of the pandemic to try to help out, and you know, they've always had just good just a good basis, a good a good management team overall. So <laughs> I, I would I ten dollars, thirty percent implied, twenty percent. You got to have good markets, and I think that's where by saying Ford, what you're saying is uh, when it was down around that price is you have cheap options around ten dollars. You have okay implied volatility, and you have enough trading to behoove decent markets. And I guess that would be the mix. The biggest thing about trading lower price uh, stocks, uh, trading options on lower price stocks, is if they don't have the volume in them, you just, it's, you're just paying so much 
for that option contract overall when you look at bid ask spreads and and Ford had it all for for a ten dollar stock. Uh, I think at one point in time they were thinking about doing the reverse split to the upside. I'm kind of glad they did. I like that they're still a twenty dollar stock overall. Uh, I usually will trade more expensive stocks. Like uh, last week we talked about uh, on on the show Best Buy, one hundred thirty. $132 stock, and I and I prefer if I'm I'm looking at uh, interesting trades like butterflies or a little bit more to have a little bit more juice in that option contract. But uh, yeah, Ford is I like Ford. I just like I'm not saying that that's a recommendation. I just like the concept of Ford and trading options. Uh, so there you go. So I, I, did I answer the question? <laughs> I think so. The market has reverse split it for them, so they're good now. Here's the question I've been wrestling. <laughs> here's the question I've been wrestling with Brian, and maybe you have the answer. I think the answer is kind of obvious now, but maybe not. Is Ford a meme stock now? <laughs> no, it is not a meme stock. It would have to. It would have to not have any earnings. It's that simple. Yeah, it's not heavily shorted, and it makes money, but it moves like a meme stock. That's for sure. If all you're going by is price action. Then it's got some, let's say, meme characteristics. <laughs> right. I do remember, Mark, I have one little anecdote. I do remember I was talking to somebody, and it was a while back, but somebody came up to me and I was telling them about a company, and they and they uh, literally looked me in the eye and said, I don't want to buy that. That company's got earnings. And I, it still just struck me because they were very succinct about the fact that they didn't want to buy a company <laughs> that had earnings. That reminds me when I was on the floor of the SIBO back at the last time we did this dance in the dot com craze. And I remember talking to multiple people about different names that they were all excited about. And I would say, what does it do? And they would say, who cares? It's internet. That was kind of the version of that. <laughs> and now you're right. Now it's like, oh, it has earnings. I don't want to touch that. That's like the 2021 incarnation of that. All right, let's keep on rolling. Patrick says, question for the podcast. Well, you send it to the right place, Patrick. He says, I have a question about protective puts for long-term buy and hold in something like SPY. Is it preferred to pick a strike at the excuse me at monthly expiration and then roll up or down? At what point does one choose to roll up or down? Let's say a fifty percent loss or gain. Also, would it make sense to do a complex collar with a shorter dated out of the money call weekly or bi weekly and a month or two out of the money longer put? Thanks, uh, Brian. A lot to unpack here. He wants to buy and hold puts in spy but do it every month effectively and if he does that he wants to know when he should roll and would it be better for him to do a complex collar or something else against it oh okay um usually if i'm buying insurance um saying longer term like i very rarely would go more than a month out uh, especially, I guess you're trying to insure an entire portfolio here, talking about the spy or the spiders. Um, and if if I'm if I'm looking at that trade, once it came down or uh, once it got to the strike price or a little bit below that price, that's always what I'm usually choosing to roll. And that's mainly because you're getting the most bang for your buck. I'm not saying that it has to be right at that strike price, but I think of rolling to on the downside, even to try to make gains or losses overall, um, just gains in general, as the same thing I would do on a covered call. I just don't want it to get too deep in the money where it's all intrinsic value before I would roll, especially if I'm doing this on a longer term basis. Um, and that's what I'm working on here. It sounds like every month we're doing some rolling and I would continue to get a little bit in the money and then roll, not get way in the money overall. Also, um, does it make sense to do the complex count? I have seen that happen, but realize that when you sell a shorter term option and it gets in the money, um, it's going to move against you a lot quicker than your out of the money option contract would help you if it got in the money. It's just the, the way the game is. You pick up Delta in that instance. So you got to manage that short term call if you're doing it. You don't want to fall asleep. You want to have a plan in place of when you're going to roll and how you're going to look to do it. And once again, exact same situation as if I'm buying an out of money put to try to protect my entire portfolio. If I'm selling an out of the money call on a shorter term basis to cheapen my insurance, which is what we're trying to do here. If it does hit the strike, I want an alert on it. 
and then I want to think about rolling at that point in time. Um, but I don't like going more than a month out. I, I don't know about about because because of what you're you're talking about here. And I don't, uh, Patrick was asking the question Be, because it, it you know if you're going three or four months out, that is a much tougher question about where my strike should be, right? So if I go three months out and let's say uh, the market goes up. Right. And all of a sudden my strike is, you know, 20 points out of the money in the spies. Um, do I roll up then as opposed to rolling down when I have a gain on my put? So the, the, the question about when I would roll when I go further out in time and I'm correct on my forecast, if I'm doing this, I want the market to go up. Right. I'm buying protection. I, I, I'm buying insurance. I would prefer that the market went up as opposed to went down and I had to use my insurance. Um, but so a month would be the most. I, I, and, I, and I'm kind of curious to hear how Mark would approach it too overall. You know, it's interesting. Usually uh, I'm with you. I don't like to uh, go too crazy uh, far out. But in the case of SPY, you know, all the numbers, you see all the data when they crunch it over time. Buying puts every month in SPY and then rolling them is an extremely expensive way to get your protection the annualized cost of that in a normal year is going to be anywhere between eight and twelve percent and a year like this where the puts are crazy bid (laughs) yeah that's going to be rough that's going to be a huge drag on your portfolio so i think over time what you're going to discover is kind of like sounds like what you have discovered with this question already is you're going to have to probably do something to offset some of that cost and now you're finding yourself in the position that a lot of the options industry is in is paying for puts. There are a lot of asset managers and people out there who spend all day long trying to figure out ways to, to pay for their protection in the S&P. Now, the good thing for you is that calls are juicier now than they have been in quite some time. Also very much in the NASDAQ. So that's a, of intrigue to you. NASDAQ names are getting very juicy from an out of the money call perspective. So selling a collar is perhaps a little bit more interesting. You still have to find a way to pay for that very expensive puts. I think over time, Things like put spreads and then maybe with a collar against it. Now you have the two short legs against that put. There's been a lot of data, a lot of research on this. OIC did a great study on this a few years back, looking at collars across a wide variety of underlyings. I like to see them update it now for the meme era, but they found kind of the sweet spot was somewhere in that three to six month range for the put. Again, that could be a little bit longer term than you want to go, but somewhere in that range to defray your time decay as much as possible and then getting as near to expiration as possible with the calls. Usually, there were no weeklies at the time that they did it, so that was front month. You could probably extrapolate that in the weeklies now. Everything Brian said is true. You want to make sure you stay on top of this. This is not a set it and forget it type trade, but trying to defray the time decay a little bit, again, that also gets into the issue of rolling. If we continue rallying the way we are, that put's going to be kind of outmoded and outdated pretty quickly, so... It might be an issue to keep consider. You have to, might have to roll that longer term put. But from a time decay perspective, that is that is the way a lot of people have opted. Somewhere in that three to six month range for the put and then getting near dated. Probably keep it simple. Keep it in the monthlies for the calls. And then as you get more sophisticated, maybe you can also consider a put leg too. But again, as Brian mentioned, the short legs, you have to know what you're doing there. Otherwise, you could easily get into a lot of trouble. Being short a lot of gamma and having only a longer term option to defend against it. It's a great question, Patrick. We could spend the whole show, I think, discussing it. But I want to get to some more out here. Let's get out to the live again. Let's go out to Nichols. Nichols says, what does Brian think of Bitto, a.k.a. the ProShares Bitcoin ETF that was all the rage just a few weeks ago and it continues to be very popular? He says, has he traded options on it yet? Also, what are Brian's thoughts on crypto trading overall? Does Ally offer that? So, a lot of questions there, Brian. Your thoughts on crypto, what Ally offers if they do from a crypto perspective, and then also your thoughts on Bitto, and then on top of it, have you traded options? So a, a four-pack for you, Brian. Uh, no, I have not traded the options on Bitto, and I do know that you guys have taught us, so I'd almost just kind of send it back to Mark a little bit about 
what is going on in Biddle. I have not traded the options in it. Ally does not do crypto trading. Uh, they, we do offer the crypto ETFs that have came out recently. And uh, I, ideally, uh, just a couple of shows ago, the one stock that I have kind of messed with in the marketplace is uh, Coin Coinbase. Uh, so it's an interesting uh, crypto, a, a way to play crypto on a company that actually makes money from uh, the fees from trading crypto. So like they actually have some earnings there. There's actually something you can look at and look up when you are researching that company overall. So I haven't done a lot on Bitto. I'm kind of would wait for it to slow down a little bit overall. The, the premiums are just just. Uh, you know, outrageous at this point in time. But I, I do know that Mark has stuck his toe in the water a little bit with some of his, with some of his clients and what he's talked about, or with some of the, I should say, listeners uh, on the show. So I, back to you, Mark. <laughs> yes. My much ballyhooed Bitto butterfly. But yes, I did dive into this a few weeks ago because I got a lot of people like you were asking questions about it and they, they wanted to know if we had trade. And I wanted to experience it myself. We had obviously talked a lot on our crypto rundown program about how big the upside is on platforms like Deribit, but that's not tenable for you folks. Now we finally have a product you can put in your securities account that you can trade options on. So it was a it was a fun one to see. And yes, the calls were very bid. I was able to leg into what was effectively a 40, I think the strikes are 40, 43. 47 fly when the bid was around 40 and a half, maybe 41 got into it for a very negligible amount. It was because the upside was so, was so favorably bid. And that's why I kind of structured it that way. So it was very much a cheap fly. It was only on for about a week. It was a weekly and a bit of a lesson in your timing for, for butterflies, which is another question people have asked us many times of late. Can't be too early and you can't be too late. Put it on for a week. Bitto went out around that Friday expiration somewhere shy of 40, like 39, 80, something like that. And then literally the next session, literally the next Monday after my fly had expired worthless, Bitcoin rallied huge. Bitto shot up to nearly 43, about 42, 80 or so, which was effectively my max profit strike there on my fly. So just one more session that would have been a huge home run on just a very nominal outlay. So if you are judicious, if you look at the premiums and try to line it up, it is interesting and attractive for things like verticals or flies, trades that allow you to sell the farther out of the money portion of the call skew because it is aggressively bid out there. That's just the way crypto and Bitcoin in particular trade these days. The OI is two to one, pretty much uh, calls over puts out there. So all the action, all the bid, all the premium is to the upside. And speaking, Brian asked about how Bitto options are trading. It's been pretty active. You know, obviously it was the fastest listed option we've ever seen out of the gate from OCC. They had listed options within 24, maybe 48 hours. And that was, that's the fastest I've ever seen, certainly. And the ADV was pretty strong. It was about 60-odd thousand, I think, when it kicked off. It's come down a little bit. It's a little bit shy of 40,000 now, but still pretty active. About 36,000 is the ADV. And today, they've done nearly 3x that, 91,000. So it's a very active name still. So if you could do worse, really, if you want to trade something crypto, this is one you could look at. Again, bear in mind, there is that drag. They have to roll every month. So there's going to be that futures drag from the Contango. So if you're just going to buy and hold it, you're probably going to want to do something against it anyway to offset that. And you, a covered call or something like a fly or something like that wouldn't be the vertical. It wouldn't be the worst thing out there. So intriguing stuff out there. A lot to do. Again, I've only just dipped my toes in it a little bit, but I know it's a very active one and a fun one for a lot of you. Good question there, Nichols. Let's keep on rolling here. Let's go out to Tim's. Tim says, <laughs> I like this, Brian. He wants more work for you. He says, what about a daily dose of OPR for us active traders? What do you think, Brian? You want to be Mr. <laughs> daily OPR man on the microphone every day? Well, we do have, you know, we they might not know about some of the other educational events. Uh, we usually do something. I usually do something every day uh, overall, but not necessarily just with on, as part of the OPR podcast. But if you'd like to check it out, uh, you can go to ally.com uh, slash uh, ed. Let me see that again. Ally.com slash invest education. Uh, no space, all one word ally.com slash invest education. And actually, you can see uh, the, the weekly events that we do there and sign up for the actual reminders uh, via the email. But on Tuesdays, we do the stock play of the day. And on Mondays, I have a midday market call that I uh, that I talk about. So I, I'm doing something almost every day. 
overall. Yeah, chances are Brian's talking options to someone when he's not talking to us. <laughs> so, uh, right? yeah, hit him up over there. They do a lot of good content over there. Even outside, I know it's hard to believe, but even outside of OPR, they do some good stuff over there. So if you want that, I forgot your name there. What was it? Uh, Tim's. If you want that, Tim's, then hit him up. Intro week. They've got content for you over there. In addition to, if you're new to the, I know a lot of you are new to the show. You got great archives of OPR you can go back to as well. So a lot for you to sink your teeth into there. Let's go to this one here. BBC, trying to squeeze as many of you in as possible here in our holiday spectacular here for you, our holiday mailbag huddle spectacular. Well, let's go to BBC 23. They say, it seems like the FOMO crowd are piling into options at a record pace. The answer is yes. Now, have you seen a corresponding bump in the numbers at Ally? And what about the options market as a whole, or are folks more flocking into stocks instead? Well, I got some numbers on the latter portion, but Brian, why don't you give us your thoughts on this and also what you guys are seeing from, as he puts it, the FOMO crowd over there at Ally, sir? Well, you gave a little bit of a little foreshadowing uh, when you were talking about the NASDAQ and out of the money calls specifically in the NASDAQ. Also, some of them in, in, in the Russell um, that we've seen. Now, IWM, we actually talked about an out of the money call in one of the Option Playbook radio episodes a, a few few weeks back. Um, yes, what we are seeing, and it's not necessarily just from our clients, but I, I have actually talked with reporters and other people about the fact that just the skewing of volatility um, we saw a couple of big up days in the S and P and in the VIX or and in the Nasdaq and the VIX actually went up with them. And so the speculation was a lot that it wasn't fear; it was greed driving the VIX higher. Uh, because the VIX is the VIX, right? It's if, if you've got to pump up volatility on money calls, it's going to affect the whole marketplace just in general. So um, yes, there has been a bump. Um, we've done uh, we've we've done really well in option trading just bluntly since the pandemic uh, and recently we've seen a few spike ups in some of the numbers on option trading as a whole. I cannot tell you if they are out of the money options though. I don't have that research with me. Uh, every once in a while I do get a report on that, but I don't get that report daily overall. So uh, are they flocking to stocks? No, I think if anything, we're seeing people flock to options more than stocks. I, I think people, just because of educational events like this, there's just so much more education that's out there. It doesn't, the learning curve uh, is shortened in the option trading world because you have events like this to be able to talk to people about it. So uh, I think that that has a lot to do with the fact that I think you're seeing a few more of that FOMO crowd using options as opposed to using stocks. Yeah, it's definitely been a, a huge resurgence. So let me just break down some numbers for you really quickly here. And Brian, I'll get your thoughts on this as well. These are the numbers coming out of OCC for October. And these are historic. And you'll see why in a second here, listeners. Uh, October 2021, total cleared volume, 825 and a half million contracts. And... That's in and of itself historic. It's the most active October in the history of the options business. The fifth most, most active, easy for me to say, I can't say it today. The fifth most active options trading month of all time. And the other four are all this year as well. So 2021 has been a banger year. But what makes it doubly historic is if you recall last year, and we all kind of want to forget 2020, one of the few bright spots in the insane year that was 2020 was options volume was through the roof. 7.52 billion contracts changed hands last year. That's a number no one sanely thought would we would ever see in the near future in options, maybe in the distant, distant future. No one thought that was something that was in the offing in the near future for the options market. But we saw it. We saw it last year. And then the question coming into this year was, can it possibly even come close to that this year? And most people thought the answer was no. Well, the answer is a resounding yes, because not only... Have we hit that number already? In fact, by mid-October of this year, we've already surpassed that level. By the end of October, the total cleared options volume for the year was 8.1 billion contracts. So already surpassed the 7.5 billion from last year. The rest of the year is just gravy. Brian, how crazy is that? That as crazy as 2020 was, already surpassed it by mid-October, and we're setting new records every day, sir. 
Oh, yeah. I did not know that that had happened, that we uh, had more volume in 2021 so far than we had all year in 2020. I did not know that. But I can feel it. I mean, you have a feeling that that's the case. Uh, our numbers go up, but we don't necessarily know if they're going up because we're getting more accounts or because of the trading. But this kind of leads to the fact that we're that obviously we're getting more more trades overall. But uh, we have definitely had this burst in option trading too, um, and Ally overall has done more volume in options than just I don't know how to said uh, the numbers don't lie. I guess <laughs> it's that simple. All right, Mr. O, we got to let you go out here. Otherwise, we can sit here answering questions all day. I appreciate you taking some time out of your schedule to put this out there for the live folks and to record it on demand for everyone else. You guys are going to get this in your ear holes next week, right around the holiday time. So while Brian and I are eating turkey, you can be listening to this next week. But before we go, Mr. Brian, you kind of mentioned some of the other content you're doing over there at Ally. If folks want to check it out, or reach out to you directly with more questions. Where should they go? What should they do? They can email me at the options guy at invest.ally.com. Follow me on Twitter. I'm tweeting a lot more nowadays. At Brian Overby. Very simple. At my name. And I want to ask to all of you, I want to say thanks for coming. Thanks for the question. We'll be back same time, same place next week. Um, until then, may all the options you bought finish in the money and all the ones you sold finish up. Thanks for coming, everyone. The Options Playbook is brought to you by Ally Invest. Anything mentioned today is for educational purposes and is not a recommendation or advice. Options involve risk. Please refer to ally.com slash invest slash disclosures to review additional risks involved with trading options. Securities offered through Ally Invest Securities, LLC, member FINRA and SIPC. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>